Good evening and uh, welcome to this event put on by Bookmarks, a socialist bookshop, um, about a new book, uh, The Brut Brutish Museums, The Ben in Bronzes, Colonial Violence and Cultural Restitution. Uh, what we're going to be doing um, over the next hour or so is discussing with uh, author Dan Hicks about the book, um, why he's written it, why it's relevant, particularly at the moment. And then after that, uh, we shall be moving um, to speak to a number of activists who are, um, have been active around issues connected with the with the issues that the book raises. Um, and in case you are unaware of it so far, I want to raise what the book's issues the book raises are, which are about museums, um, museums which are often seen in um, a modern world as something uh, where artifacts are protected are looked after and are put in a historical context um dan has uh, some questions about some of uh, some of these issues and they're questions which may seem interesting because he is himself uh, a museum curator at the pitt rivers uh, museum in oxford um so we should look at exactly what's been happening i think this is a particularly relevant discussion to be having this year uh this year when we've had black lives matter um, and a whole discussion about exactly what uh, is happening with colonial history, because um, the great museums that exist in Britain, like the British Museum, would not be there without the experience of the British Empire. And this is something uh, which we are um, going to talk about. So I should just say before um, bringing um, in Dan, that uh, the other um, speakers uh, tonight will be um, Onyakachi Wampu, um, who is somewhat uh, from the African Foundation for Development um, and is interested in movements around restitution for things that have been uh, taken from Africa and the return of icons and so on. So I should bring him in later to discuss uh, what's being done at, uh, by activists around that. We have um, Dia Gupta. Um, who is working with the Royal His Historical Society uh, to help decolonize um, their version of history. And I think that fits very much with what I've said is one of the big issues uh, that are going up on today. Um, and finally, Chris um, Gerard, Garrard, sorry, uh, and I apologize for anyone else whose name I've uh, mispronounced if I have, um, who will be talking about extractive colonialism, about links between uh, the museums, um, particularly, I think, I believe in this case, the British Museum and um, extractive companies and oil companies and how this affects what's shown and how we are intended to interpret it. So that, I think, should be uh, a mixture of discussion about history and how it happened um, and what you can do about it now, both to understand, have a greater understanding of history and uh, to change things. Because to me, one of the great things about the Black Lives Matter movement this year was that it became not just looking at history, but becoming history and, uh, and writing history. So uh, I'm going to start straight away by coming to trying to talk to um, Dan Hicks um, about his new book and about what um, it is that he has been um, has been looking at. Um, for people who um, don't know, the Benin bronzes, uh, which he uh, talks about, were artworks um, cast, as you may have guessed, in bronze um, in West Africa, um, and remarkably beautiful pieces uh, uh, of art, which created a, something of a stir in the late 19th century um, and were brought to Britain arguably for their own protection. But I think that this is something uh, which Dan um, has been um, questioning. So, but I want to start, Dan, by um, asking about the idea of museums. Um, I suppose if you're going to criticize uh, museums and uh, a lot of what they're doing which seems to be the purpose of a lot of the book how does this shelf with yourself being a museum curator do you see museums as having a value sure okay thank you ken and it's uh, really nice to be here and in this conversation um and so yeah i've been curator at the pitt rivers museum in oxford which is a part of the university of oxford it's a museum of archaeology and anthropology, 
you know, I've been curator here for a little over 13 years. Um, and over that time, you know, obviously as, uh, as someone you know, looking after what's called world archaeology, uh, which includes every, you know, country in the world and objects that were taken from a, you know, a whole host of different contexts, uh, you know, a big part of my job has been to understand the value of those objects. You go to the people you, uh, today, understand their histories, uh, you know, understand their meanings. You know, now, while as a curator, a big part of my job, obviously, also is to try to keep some things the same. You know, the idea of a museum is that you make sure that the that the moths don't eat the, you know, the fabrics and the iron objects don't rust away and so on. But some curators, I think, in the past have mistaken that role of the conservator for trying to, if you like, you know, to prevent history from happening around the museum, for the museum, you know, to change because the world changes. And, you know, the world obviously has changed, you know, since 1884, you know, when the Pitt Rivers opened. Um, and of course, anthropology and archaeology as uh, uh, disciplines also have evolved, have changed. But sometimes in our museums, we've been out of step with how our, our academic uh, disciplines have changed. There's something about the museum space that is maybe actually more, you know, maybe it is something for, about museums, maybe it's actually about all institutions. We can just see it a bit more easily in museums that they can tend to ossify, they can they can become time warps. Things that seemed okay once upon a time can kind of remain. So while anthropology ever since, you know, the 60s and 70s under, you know, was a part of uh, an ongoing process of having to rethink itself as part of the civil rights movement, uh, actually our museums haven't, haven't kept in sort of pace. And really that, that, I think is most visible when it comes to objects on display that were taken with violence, where that violent history of, you know, looting, you know, where the racial stories that were told in the 1890s at the height of anthropology's relationship with, you know, fake race science, with certain aspects of, you know, white supremacy, they're things that when they do persist, I mean, some of what persists is great. That what That's what makes a museum. Some of these things are like a cancer that we have to see the way in which they persist. They continue, you know, to hurt people in the present. So that I think, you know, I hope that answers your initial question about, you know, why on earth is a curator saying that a museum, you know, ought to change? I would, though, just say that actually, in the, you know, you know, really in any other line of work to say, you know, that you want to improve, that you want to do things better, that you want to make your field fit for the 21st century, you know, would not be controversial. And so I, I am always surprised by the idea that some people in this conversation finds that anti-racism in a museum sector is in some ways, you know, not essentially what we should be doing, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so just following on from that, I suppose, the um, there are two other things. Firstly, uh, museums as we know them, a lot of the big museums, were products of the 19th century, products of that sort of ex expansion, and therefore often went along with attitudes of the time when they were created, I suppose, an othering of people from other parts of the world, particularly, and also... Um, well, you've already mentioned race, a racist looking down on people, which is related to, for instance, the display of body parts and so on from uh, captured or conquered peoples. Now, I assume this is the sort of thing that you're precisely saying needs to be reassessed. But I wonder if there's any comments about, I think, about museums because of when they first emerged. Does the very idea of what a museum is have to change? So I think ideas of what a museum is have, have, have always changed. They're always continuing to change. There's always innovation in any part of the cultural sector. And actually, when the anthropology museum or the ethnological museum, as they were called in the 1880s, 1890s, was being thought up on a you know, with a very specific, here at the Pitt Rivers, very specific 
you know, agenda for something called the evolution of culture and, and an ideology that said that if we look at, you know, material objects, we can see them evolve in the same way as the natural world evolves. And of course, that idea, which was based in the, the writing of our founder, Augustus Henry Lane Fox Pitt Rivers, himself a soldier, himself someone that came up with that theory based on his own work to improve the rifle as it was used by the British Army. You know, you know that idea of you know, cultural evolution was obviously, you know, put to work for the purposes of you know, white supremacy. Now, you know, in 1946, after we um, you know, beat the fascists, in the Natural History Museum here in Oxford, which is a part of the same building of the Pitt Rivers. I mean, you know, you, know, you have to imagine the Pitt Rivers was built as a sort of physical extension of the Natural History Museum founded in 1860, you know, 24 years later in 1884. And that extension was built almost to enact that intellectual move of saying, you know, we can move from nature to culture in this evolutionary frame. But in the Natural History Museum, exactly like in, you know, natural history anthropology museums around the world, there were those displays of skulls that, to that told of, of, you know, the victims of, you know, violence across empire that were there to tell the racist lie that there were different kinds of human. And in 1946, you know, actually those, dis those uh, displays were removed mm -hmm. uh, with, with no sense of controversy, with no sense of anything other than, you know, actually this is scientists who don't want to show bad science. You know, this is just fake. Um, However, at that time, even though we in the cultural end of things like to think maybe we're more attentive, you know, to questions of inequality, of race, of, you know, empire, we didn't touch the displays right next door that told the same story with objects of art, objects of culture. So a big part of the argument of the, uh, um, yeah, the book, you know, is that art in this instance you know, who, who knew art would be important for world history? Who knew that looting wasn't just some sideshow, some side effect of empire, you know, something that's always happened in any conflict, that actually, you know, you know, it was a central, it, at this time, it was actually a central technique of how the museum was put to work by a sort of a proto-fascist, you know, way of thinking, a racial ideology, which has no place in the modern world, you know, today. So that's the legacies that we're trying to, uh, that we're trying to deal with now. Okay, I'd like to um, just, I think, bring in one more question, um, really for you, and then try and bring in some of the other people as well. Um, because the, 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 I want to bring in the issue of specifically the Benin bronzes. Um, and why the British government, uh, British authorities, we say, uh, felt the need, well, to how they justified conquering Edo, how they um, justified taking away these artefacts. Um, and this might be something that other people might want to think about coming in as well. Um, culturally, there's a significance to the Benin bronzes in particular, which sometimes goes is slightly separate from other bits of art, but um, I don't want to just get into a long conversation about this, but how did that kind of colonial expansion get justified in the first place? I'll start with Dan and then we'll open up and then we'll move on to a discussion about cultural restitution, which is, you know, where we're moving on to. Thank you. Absolutely, thanks. Yeah, so the book outlines really the, you know, the way in which the kind of the house of cards that has been built up over the years of the stories that have sought, you know, you know, to account for the taking of the Benin bronzes, uh, how each part of the narrative we've been told that there was a sort of grim you know, justification for the taking of the loot because it was sold off to pay for the cost of the expedition, that the expedition itself was a necessary punishment for a wrongdoing, you know, by the king of uh, Benin. All these you know, that the objects were safer in the West than they were where they've been you know, looked after for, in some cases, over 500 years in you know, what is now Nigeria. Each of those arguments really falls apart after you look at it. The expedition was long planned, was part of a long set of techniques, 
of of your corporate colonialism, extractive colonialism, wanting to build the, you know, the rubber industry and the palm oil industry, uh, you know, in this area up and down the Niger River, they were constantly, you know, removing, you know, regimes and chiefs and kings, you know, over the years. And the naval operations, sheer violence was, is obviously documented, but also the taking of those artworks was, from an African perspective, about the removal of a traditional religion, about the desecration of a royal and sacred landscape, as well as only about the removal of a sovereign. At the same time, the sheer free-for-all, the chaotic nature of each of these soldiers simply enriching themselves by loading up what they could and taking it back. Some of these objects find their way on the open market within weeks and are in the British Museum in Oxford, in Berlin. You know, whereas others are kept by families and then enter the market over years. So, you know, it's a chaotic mess. It was simply, you know, corporate violence at an extreme level with the Maxim machine guns firing, with the rocket launchers, you know, electric lighting, barbed wire, you know, mountain guns. This was like a, and indeed, you know, dum-dum bullets, one of the first uses, you know, I argue of the dum-dum bullet. So this is a foreshadowing of all the horror of the 20th, of, 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 of the, you know, that we, you know, that we would see in the 20th century, you know, a late 19th century foreshadowing where these sort of ultra-modern violent sort of, you know, approaches were tested on African bodies and the taking of art was a, was a central element of that. Thank you. And just a reminder to people who are watching that all of these arguments will be available in much more greater depth in the book, which I would recommend uh, that people buy um, because you will be able to follow arguments and discussions uh, in greater depth than we can manage in this time. Um, but I would also like to, since we're also talking about activism today, I would like to bring in um, some other people to talk around, first around this issue, but also um, around the issues of your own particular concerns. Now, what I'd like to do, if possible, is bring in um, each of you to introduce you and then perhaps open things up a bit more. So I don't want to just have one, two, three, four going round, but have more of a, a more of a, a conversation going on. Um, but um, Anya Kachi, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, I'd like to ask you uh, specifically because the um, area that you're dealing with in terms of uh, talking about restitution and the return of icons, um, in some ways speaks directly to what we've just been talking about to do with the Benin bronzes and so on. Um, how you respond to the idea about the way that museums work and how they have taken um, various artefacts uh, with various justifications from Africa. Oh, sorry, uh, you're muted at the moment. Uh, whoever's in control of the muting, can you oh, unmute? Would, yeah, I would be, thank you. I was thought I would be unmuted. Thank you. Thanks very much. And, um, and, uh, and thanks, Dan, for a wonderful book. And I think the book, in a sense, answers the questions that you're asking, because at the heart of um, what is got, the, you know, the museums were part of that empire project. Um, and Dan in the book makes the links, uh, not just the empire project, it was part of the slavery and colonization project. Um, you know, the money that Pitts and others used to fund um, their later adventures elsewhere were, you know, sometimes directly related from the compensation they got from slave plantations in the Caribbean. So it, it's a story of slavery, colonization and empire. And um, the project that um, I've been involved in this since around 1994 and the, and the date is, is, you know, formally, I've been thinking about these issues for a long time, but formally in terms of the activism, around 93, 94, when Bernie Grant started an African uh, reparations movement to return um, these objects. We, in fact, um, demonstrated outside the British Museum in those days and everybody laughed. But in 1994-95, I started a, a, an organization called African Remembrance Day to remember the victims of this period because, you know, a lot happened and, and you know, millions died um, and nobody has been doing anything to actually remember what what happened um, and everything else. Fast forward to 
um, earlier this year, we started a, a project called Return of the Icons. And what we're trying to do with the project, is, as the icons say, we, we are interested in returning ideas, we're interested in returning aesthetics and iconic individuals, because as well as the artifacts, there are lots of human remains in these um, uh, collections as well. And, uh, and why do we want to do that? There were two um, events recently that in the same week that were very, very powerful and actually demonstrate why, why this is important. Um, the Barbados government, as part of its own decolonization process and trying to launch itself as a republic, decided to remove Nelson's statue, which stands in the middle of a massive square in Barbados. And that Nelson statue in, in Bridgetown, Barbados, is actually older than the Nelson statue in Trafalgar Square. And when it was being taken away, it was filmed, the prime minister came out, and it was a very solemn um, event and ceremony, um, white-robed um, individuals on, on uh, stilts walked alongside what looked like a coffin of Nelson lying on his back. And it was like what we were seeing was the burial of a symbol and also an idea being kind of taken away. And in the same week, uh, the French returned the crown um, the, of the last queen of Madagascar. And again, the crown was returned from France um, met at the airport, the whole of Madagascar seemed to turn out, Prime uh, President, everybody. And then the, uh, the crown is taken in, in a carriage through the streets of the capital city and everybody comes out to witness this. And what we're seeing is that it's almost as if history that had been frozen uh, and over the period of this colonization was being reborn. And then as I said, across the Atlantic, which was part of the same massive story, you have Nelson being removed and, and buried. And so there's a moment, and, and Dan very wonderfully in his book talked about this moment using Akil Mbembe's concept of, an, of a negative moment, uh, when new antagonisms emerge and old ones remain unresolved. And 94 is really important in terms of understanding what this moment, this negative moment is that we're going through. And, um, we, you know, because something big happens in 94, which is a, a period of codified African inferiority and uh, white supremacy and the codification of white supremacy ends um, with, uh, you know, the changes in South Africa. And what we are all doing now is looking back at that period and, and what happened from slavery, colonization, and empire. Uh, and, and we've started at uh, Ford discussing this, and Dan's book, I think, very wonderfully comes at this from different perspectives. And we're discussing them as kind of, uh, what we're saying is the kind of reclamation of three R's, which is recognition of what happened. And we can see in the fight for black history in the curricula that nobody even wants to acknowledge what's happened. Then we're talking about remembrance, which is, as I said, what we try to do in terms of remembering the victims. And then there's restoration uh, of culture and ideas. There's restitution that we're now talking about returning the artifacts and human remains. There's reparations and that campaign is ongoing. There's reconnection between the severed African world uh, because a, a massive uh, wound was done to the African world. And then there's return, which people like the Rastas and others have been trying to do, physical return, and then reimagination, reconstruction, uh, and we hope finally kind of renaissance. Um, so what we, for us, this struggle, and, and, and Dan's book is a wonderful, wonderful, massive weapon in allowing us to engage in this multiple fronted struggle of these 10 Rs um, is going to grow and it's going to keep growing because, um, you know, as Akil says, we are in that negative moment. The collision has happened. And all of us, I'm um, really glad that Dan started this with excavating and dissecting this from his own workplace. All of us are going to have to undertake that work in our own yeah. workplace as well. Okay, thank you. Um, just to say, uh, firstly, um, I believe you're referring to uh, Akil Mbembe's book, uh, Necropolitics, yes. which would be uh, recommended um, as well when people are looking at books. But what you've just been saying, I think, leads very neatly into uh, Dia Gupta's area 
of talking about history. So I hope I hope we can br to, uh, bring you back in later on to talk about practical things that people can do. But for now, I'd like to ask uh, Dia to talk about uh, precisely this area of how you decide what is history and what historians uh, should discuss, and indeed how you decolonize. Um, well, I shall leave it to you to to say that. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for um, having me here. It's an absolute pleasure to be talking about uh, Dan's book. Um, just for, for everybody who doesn't know me, I am past and present fellow, uh, Race, Ethnicity and Equality at the Royal Historical Society. And one of my biggest roles at the Royal Historical Society is to look at race and equality initiatives across the discipline of history. And precisely as, as Dan was saying before, we've got to make sure that history is suitable for a 21st century um, audience and uh, as a discipline that it's invigorated and refreshed with, with fresh perspectives. And, and sort of my post came about uh, quite strangely because of this initiative that the Royal Historical Society had taken in 2018, where it, where it did this massive survey of the state of the field in history. And this was the, the then published race report and actually what the race report found was rather shocking. It found that history was the fifth least diverse discipline in the country. And it found that from GCSE and A levels for black and minority ethnic students to get onto the undergraduate level of studying history was hard enough. But then the, the further you kind of went along the academic pathway, it just got harder and harder. And I've got some stats for you here. So at the undergrad level, black and other minority ethnic students make up in history only 11% of the cohort. If you go on to postgraduate levels of study, black and minority ethnic students make up only 8.6% of the cohort. And finally, when you get to academic staff, only 6.3% are black and minority ethnic, out of which only 0.5%, and this to me is a really shocking statistic, are black. So, but on the other hand, when you talk to students from black and minority ethnic backgrounds, you realize that they're really passionate about history. So there's clearly some sort of disjunction happening here between the sorts of histories that we were providing as institutions and the sorts of histories that people actually wanted to study. And this is what the Royal Historical Society is really invested in now, you know, in, in issues of who gets to do history and what sort of histories should we be studying. And this is where I feel that Dan's book makes such an important intervention because it brings straight to the forefront these violent histories that we should all really know about. Thank you. Again, um, I would like to hope we can bring you back um, soon to talk about um, at activities that people uh, can get involved in um, uh, but I would like to bring in uh, Chris to talk about um, some activity that people um, should know about at the time. Chris is a campaigner with um, Culture Unstained uh, which talks to um, about oil companies and their connections with museums and modern uh, culture. So I shall ask Chris to um, explain how that works at the moment and what they were campaigning around. Great. Thank you very much. And yeah, and thank you both Dan for your book and also for being asked to, to speak this evening. Um, so Culture Unstained is one organisation of many that are part of quite a, a diverse and um, growing movement which is focused specifically on the the role of major oil companies like bp shell total etc and the way in which they've embedded themselves within our major cultural institutions um, and so people are probably familiar with the fact that bp was a major sponsor of tate for example and and campaigners managed to end that relationship but um you also have BP sponsoring the British Museum currently. You previously had Shell sponsoring the Van Gogh Museum in uh, Amsterdam, Total sponsoring the Louvre in Paris. And this was really a way of these, uh, these fossil fuel companies kind of maintaining their cultural capital, their, their position in society, um, but also a way of kind of burnishing their brand identities, particularly around the kind of environmental impacts they would have um, through their extractive practices, but also more recently, 
trying to cultivate a positive image of themselves in the face of climate change. And they would sort of frame themselves as, as philanthropists. We're sort of used to the idea of cultural institutions being having collectors and then donors and so on. And they sort of modeled themselves as these, these kind of gift givers that are supporting the cultural sector. But the, the reality is that their contributions were often very small that they would be very small in terms of the the vast budgets of billions of dollars that were still going into the, the extractive business models. So this was actually, in effect, a form of cheap advertising. Now, the way that this kind of really, I think, connects with, with Dan's book is that these companies, that fossil fuel industry, um, and particularly a company like BP, which was originally British Petroleum, they have their roots in empire. And imperialism. So just as the theft of objects and resources from the global south um, was, was sort of essentially rooted in uh, environmental racism, that this we also saw mirrored in the theft of resources, whether that was oil, rubber, minerals, and so on. And so there was that those kind of colonial roots which are now being taken and looked at within the origins of, of many of our, our kind of most well-known museums, and particularly somewhere like the British Museum, are mirrored within these fossil fuel companies. And so in a way, even though this is a, a problematic relationship, in some ways it's quite apt that the British Museum has this deeply entrenched re relationship with what was British petroleum, that there's this mirroring. And I think the, the interesting point that emerges in Dan's book is, is this kind of um, sense of, of how this comes into the present, for example. And through our kind of research, there, there are these cases where particularly BP, for example, has been in Tate or particularly in the British Museum and taking the opportunity of sponsoring mm -hmm. exhibitions and events as a way of meeting people, as a way of lobbying members of governments, policy makers, and you actually see the cultural institution becoming an active participant, being complicit in the continuation of essentially a, a, a business practice that is rooted in environmental racism. Um, so the BP's kind of continued extraction of oil and gas in uh, West Papua, Egypt, Azerbaijan, uh, the Gulf Coast is, is sort of being supported and endorsed by the British Museum. So that, that kind of colonial business practice is, is being furthered through this kind of close relationship. And, and the problem we see is a, a continual denial of this by those at the top of these institutions, those where the, the kind of power sits, um, sort of get trapped in this, this weird kind of web of, of um, ethical relativism almost, in order to avoid the, the actual question that these business practices are pushing us deeper into climate crisis. And, and the reality is that these, the climate change is itself a racist crisis, that the impacts of climate change are, are being felt now and are most impacting people of color and people in the global south and indigenous peoples. So there's this repetition of, of that imbalanced relationship that's happening. And this, this kind of campaign around sponsorship Yes, it's quite specific about, you know, really trying to campaign and push for climate justice. But by ending these relationships, we're also working more collaboratively with other campaigns around restitution, around decolonization, to try and collectively open up a space for creating change within our museums and cultural institutions and, and to reimagine what they could be if they were about promoting racial justice, social justice, climate justice, that if we can open the door, if we can reclaim the power and, and demand some accountability from these institutions, that, that we create new new possibilities, new opportunities to reimagine the world. Um, and maybe just to conclude this thought, one of the most significant changes that came about was that Adaf Suayef, the um, author, resigned from the board of the British Museum, partly in this frustration at this, the museum's immovability, its refusal to change around the issue of sponsorship and uh, around treatment of workers, and also around the issue of restitution. And she said, uh, she wrote this amazing piece when she um, resigned from the British Museum, and she said, the museum is not a good thing in and of itself. 
It is only good to the extent that its influence in the world is for good. The collection is a starting point, an opportunity, an instrument. Will the museum use it to influence the future of the planet and its people? Or will it continue to project the power of colonial gain and corporate indemnity? She says, this is a museum of material objects that charts the way the world has been made and remade over history. Will it be involved in making a world that is habitable, just, interconnected and open for the next generation? Or will it continue to collaborate with those who are making the world before our eyes? Thank you. Um, I want to open things up a bit now. Now we've had um, some comments on um, the chats, um, which I would like to bring in because I think they relate uh, to some of the things people have been saying. Uh, so for instance, we've had a, a question on Twitter that says that um, Dan talked about the destruction of Benin City and could he say something slightly more ab about that. Now, what I'd like to do is connect this to another comment that has been made um, in the comments and not necessarily just open it up to Dan, but to anyone who wants to come in about what the, why and what, when the, de the de destruction of Benin happened. But also Martin has commented, um, it's worth emphasizing that a key part of how the British operated during the colonial era saw looting and destruction as both an integral part of defeating their enemies, um, but also part of how they made the military function. Troops were rewarded from looting and what couldn't be looted was systematically destroyed. Witness the destruction of the Summer Palace in China in the 1860s and the behavior of the East India Company. Um, something described in William Dalrymple's recent book. So that's um, quite a comprehensive comment there, but I hope that uh, in terms of either what happened in, in Africa or the, just the level of destruction. And I'd like to uh, leave it open because uh, what Chris has just been talking about, about modern destruction, uh, I think you could link into uh, some of Shell's relationship to the um, Agoni people, to the killing, it's a while ago now, but of Ken Sarawiwa and so on. So I see a, a continuous movement through here. So. I'm not particularly looking at any one person, but so if people want to come in uh, on this, obviously it's Dan's book, so if he wants to come in, but obviously what this subject relates to pretty much everyone who's on the panel. So um, who wants to come in? If no one looks particularly, I'm going to pick on Dan and say, do you want to come in? <laughs> and anyone else who wants to come in, wave, and we'll try and bring you in immediately afterwards. Uh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, really happy to come in on that. So, yeah, you know, the uh, the question then um, about looting and its history, I mean, I think, you know, the book goes into victorian histories of the so-called small wars or, or the little wars these uh these expeditions that we've seen as ha happening because they've been presented that way as you know little incidents expedition almost that makes it sound like it's a bunch of you know boy scouts out for the day um in fact the book you know introducing the idea of uh, world war zero that that sort of 30 year period between the Berlin uh, Congress of 1884, you know, up until 1914, the First World War, you know, it actually says, well, well, yeah, in that period and arguably, you know, earlier as well, there is a, you know, concerted campaign, which isn't, again, another euphemism, it isn't the scramble for Africa which makes it sound like this was just uh, Europeans, you know, elbowing each other out of the way. This is an attack upon Africa and, uh, and Africans in a, you know, wholly new way. And 1884 is not only the date of, of the founding of the Pitt Rivers Museum and of, of the Berlin Congress, it's also the year in, in which the, uh, uh, the Maxim uh, you know, was invented. So the machine gun, you know, actually has, has, has a central role here. But the taking of, of objects. Now, some of the men involved, you know, in the Benin expedition were veterans of, the, you know, the famous attack, you know, mentioned in uh, the, uh, you know, the Chinese, you know, case of the, the uh, you know, the taking of objects from the Summer Palace. But of course, 
you know, the thing that happened in between those things was the end of the corporate colonialism. You know, the East India Company, you know, was a violent and yeah, buccaneering, uh, you know, you know, organization. But I don't think, I mean, I haven't really realized you know, to what extent the return of the company model, you know, in the 1880s with, I mean, obviously in uh, Cecil Rhodes in sort of South Africa, you know, with his company in East Africa, there's an equivalent on the British side, but also in this case, the Royal Niger Company. And the corporate nature of, you know, these attacks means that the looting really was, and indeed the act, the act of destruction, really was an act of, you know, free for all. Um, so yeah, I think I mean that goes to to answer maybe those those issues of, you know, we we need to be careful of the kind of you know, the uh, the what aboutism that soon turns into a where will it endism where people start saying, well, looting is a sort of you know, universal of war, objects have always moved from A to B. Something very distinctive happened in the 1880s you know, onwards, which is actually the regimes of display in the museum and the dispossession of art and you know, sovereign and religious objects in Africa was a part of a new ideology of race. So that's, it's the racial dimensions of this history, uh, you know, and the way in which as we try to tackle racism in our, in our museums, in our, our cultural institutions in the present, understanding that that violence is being reenacted every day, you know, you know, that we open our doors and we display, you know, these objects while they are being, you know, asked for to be returned. So hopefully that, that, yeah, that answers those questions and it yeah, maybe leads into some um, comments of others. Yes, I would like to raise an issue, I think, connected to that, specifically relating to the Benin bronzes and the difficulties they created for some racists at the time who said that Africans were incapable of creating high culture. Um, I don't know if this is anything anyone wants to comment on. Um, did I see your hand up on your uh, catchy? Yes. Yeah, I want to just uh, follow up on what Don, uh, um, sorry, um, Dan was saying. Um, I mean, that period zero that he's he's talking about. I mean, uh, others have written very eloquently about what was going on. It's the period where John Hobson writes imperialism, and you know, and then at the end of the twenties or, or shortly after, Lenin does, um, you know, imperialism as a, you know, the, the next stage of capitalist development. So w there is something going on in terms of political economy there, and it's important to understand that. And and yes, inside of all of that, the that racial identification is going on, but there there is something about the looting and the, as I said, political economy and, 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 and the modes of production that are, are happening and the needs of, um, the imperial centers for new resources and and then so it's part of a package um somebody asked about what happens in terms of the decolonization agenda um and the fear that the museums have about uh having empty <laughs> empty shelves uh, or empty, empty cabinets and and then somebody else asked a question around you know how, how do we create an anti-racist mu uh, movement within the museum sector and I think um, I go back to what Dan said in the book that we all need to kind of excavate from where we're standing because it is a, a system it's an economic system that all of us are involved in and we need to look at the alliances that uh, people made uh, at the beginning of the you know 20th century when you know the workers themselves began to understand what was at the heart of that system and the alliances they created um, to, to try and improve conditions for themselves, to try and create um, international movements that would address it from multiple perspectives. And, uh, you know, we, we it's, it's very unpopular to talk about all of that these days, <laughs> but, but that's where the work has to be done. And, uh, and we need to make those connections. And, you know, also just on a personal level, if the demand for seeing human remains in, in, in from the public it, you know, diminishes, the, the museums will change. So there's something also about some public uh, activity that we can do 
to sensitize people. I mean, why, why, why do we have uh, fancy that uh, going out on a Sunday to go and view human remains is, is somehow acceptable? Why, how does that happen? Uh, and why are we still in that moment? Uh, and, and why is it that we can fight to keep British cultural icons here when there's threats for them to be sold abroad and we don't understand that people in Benin, this stuff means, you know, it fundamentally means something to them because it's about their identity, the way they can discuss their history. You know, can we not make those connections as individuals anymore? Okay. Um I would like to uh, comment. Um, Anya Kachi mentioned a comment that said about curation uh, has often been used to justify colonialism. How can this be challenged? Um, I think this is a good question, which I think is implicit in everything that answer that's been given so far, but people might want to uh, say more about it. I'm just um, going through some of the uh, comments that have been made. Um, and again, I'm open to anyone uh, from the panel coming in. Um, Shirley, who uh, studied social anthropology at Pitts Rivers Museum um, and in the 1970s taught in Nigeria, talks about uh, the very radical head of the secondary school where I worked, uh, Tai Solarin, uh, got the kids to play only local music to celebrate local customs, eat local food in an anti-Western, anti-colonial mood. Um, Shirin um, talks about uh, how does this tie in with questions of what's going on at the moment, such as redundancies and cutbacks going on in museums, and how can we organise as museum workers to create an anti-racist museum sector? That seems like a, a good question for, well, pretty much anyone who's uh, uh, on the panel there. Uh, and an interesting thing, again, this is something um, Anya Kachi referred to, um, Anna, who's from Russia, who talks about how museum professionals are worried by decolonization as they see it as a threat, um, because, as it said, things will be removed uh, from the uh, from the museums. Um, so, how can uh, we turn that around? I mean, I suppose the question is that makes it a bigger question about why the best museums that have the most loot, for want of a better word, in tend to be in London and Berlin and so on. But um, I'm just going through um, and we'll also say Matt has said, I've just read, read Adam Hostchild's King Leopold's Ghost, focusing on the role of King Leopold of Belgium. Um, am I right to assume the debate about the British museums also has resonance for Belgian, German and French museums? I think it's fairly safe to say yes to that, I would um, argue. Um, and Richard says, it's interesting how the Nazis were reviled for stealing religious and other artifacts much later than the 1800s. Um, so those are some of the comments that have been made there. I, um, I suppose Shirin's thing about what you can do as a, in, a, um, in a museum at a time of redundancies is a specific question uh, to people. Um, and the um a question comes up about the other uh, countries that matt referred to um there was a big anti-colonial uh, thing about german colonialism in germany i'm just wondering um i'm opening this up because it shouldn't really be me talking about it to ask who wants to come in um on any of those points or anything's about uh, general activism to decolonize uh museums um Prob I'm, I'm looking particularly at uh, Chris and Dia, since you haven't come in. Oh, Dia, do you want to come in? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I don't know if this addresses directly any of the, the questions that have been asked, but I've always struck, been struck by the word loot itself. You know, it's, it's a word that's rooted um, in imperial context. So the word loot, loot comes from the Sanskrit word luntan, which means to rob. And it really became part of the English language with the East India Company's activities in India. Um, this was in 1757 with the, the Battle of Plassey. And I think we only see um, these activities increasingly harden and increasingly get more racist with what Dan's describing in his book in the 19th mm -hmm. century. Okay, thank you. Uh and Chris, did you want to come in on this? 
Um, I just had a, a sort of immediate response to the question about uh, redundancies within the sector. And so one of the like really important things that the, the campaign, the movement uh, around oil sponsorship has, has done as it's evolved, and I think as, as many other campaigns around museums, is the kind of solidarity between the different campaigns and movements. And I think that's really key. And, and one of the ones for us is, is been working in partnership with the PCS union that represent a lot of front of house workers. And I think one of the really important things is those, those kind of inequalities, the, the lack of respect often for rights of workers in front of house teams is not a new phenomenon. And the financial pressures that have come about from the pandemic and so on are, are kind of just intensifying the spotlight on it. And it's also forcing <laughs> Uh, those at the top of those institutions to have to decide what they value. Are they going to protect their salaries or are they going to protect their front of house workers? And a few years ago, we had this really interesting kind of moment where Hartwig Fisher, the director of the British Museum, was speaking about the diverse workforce of the British Museum. Um, actually, the curatorial team of the British Museum isn't very diverse, which is one point. But also, secondly, is the front of house team that is diverse within the British Museum, and they are often those who are most at risk when redundancies come around as well. So there, there are kind of real sort of fundamental issues there about the, the kind of diversity within the workforce and how they're treated in these moments. And so it's really important that we continue to show our solidarity with those unions and, and, and with workers uh, across the board. There was just a point about um, curation that I quickly wanted to, to maybe touch upon if that's okay is that I think there's an intersection um, and it maybe relates to what was being said about why is it that we still think it's acceptable to go to a museum and see particular objects on display? Why is it that we think a company like BP should still, that it's still acceptable for them to be drilling for new oil after we saw what they did in the Gulf of Mexico, after we've seen what Shell has done in Agoniland, for example? Why, why do these things perpetuate? And there's a kind of process of normalization. And you sort of see that in the, the pseudo mutual language that you might see in the British Museum around the Guigal Shield, for example, around the Benin Bronzes that, that keeps that story uh, sort of desensitized, neutralized, removes the emotion, removes the, the reality of the human story from it as well. And then we had this bizarre situation where the museum hosted an exhibition on indigenous Australia, enduring civilization. And you had again, objects which were the subject of restitution claims, the label was presented in this way, but also sponsored by BP. It was called the BP exhibition, as many of these temporary exhibitions are. So you had the normalization of the BP brand. You had the kind of normalization of the theft of the objects as well. And again, this was happening as BP was trying to drill in Australian waters against the wishes of indigenous communities as well. So again, it was this, this kind of process of normalization. And actually, I, I feel like if we disrupt that, if we disrupt that through our interventions and our protests, a different kind of conversation is possible. Sorry. So I wonder if I could just, um, uh, yes. you know, add to that, you know, really important comment. So the book links up, because it may be that people listening to this aren't entirely seeing the connections in between the BP extractivist colonialism in the present and the arguments about the taking of, um, you know, artwork in the past. But the book talks really about the link is that extractivism in its corporate colonial form was an attack upon environments as well as upon, you know, people. The active destruction of a landscape, and you know, I use uh, Rob Nixon's idea of slow violence. That sense that environmental violence operates at a certain pace, like an oil slick, like you know, nuclear waste. It, it you know, like yeah, you know, you know, like the fields being you know, poisoned over generations. That's what happens in a cultural sense as well. So the pace of that violence that we see environmentally is also reproduced in the museum. And the ideology of extractivism, which is the dispossession of Africa, you know, you know, we're aware of how that happens in terms of land rights, 
we're more than aware, of course, importantly, of you know, the dispossession of your people and the history of the the, uh, the Middle Passage. We have not attended, you know, to the taking of objects and artworks. We've seen this as some somehow not as important. And I think what we're seeing at this moment is that, of course, it's important. And of course, it was it was always a part of that, you know, of that piece of that, you know, way of um, of attempting actually, you know, to attack, you know, things that could never be given away you know, things that were inalienable in the same way as a landscaper's environment is inalienable. So that's a part, yeah, that's the, sort of one way in which these things link up. Okay. Um, just to say, I'm going to bring in um, Anya Katch again in a minute, uh, just a couple more uh, comments, both about um, the levels of uh, looting and destruction. Uh, Shirley comments that... Uh, this is destruction, something that continues in the way that US troops treated antiquities in Iraq, um, destroying them like the Taliban, she says. Um, and um, Ab Kwaku says, uh, let's not forget about the looting of Magdala to Ethiopia and the destruction there. So these are ongoing things, uh, making links between the colonialism that Dan was talking about in the 19th century and a continuation with the uh, uh, companies and what they're doing at the present. But I would like to uh, bring in um, Anya Kachi, you wanted to say something. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, I think we've been talking about dispossession and, and quite a lot. And I, I wanted to also just talk about resistance and, mm -hmm. um, and it, around 91, 92, I, I, my former life, I was a, a television producer and, I wanted to make a documentary at the time uh, for the BBC about the Benin, um, the punitive raid in Benin. And I was doing the research, went to the old uh, Museum of Mankind, where in those days the, the collection was. And there were pictures, saw the, the collections that were on display. Of course, there were many, many more in the, in the basements. But, um, and then there was the picture of the Oba, the king, uh, and he was looking at us and he had a almost a, a half smile on his face. And um, I didn't get to make the film, but my opening was going to be about the fact that we were still talking about him today because he resisted. Yeah. And in, in the act of resistance, um, yes, the, uh, the loot took place and, and we are able to talk about what happened. And the, lots of other people were defeated. Uh, who went quietly, and we don't talk about them today. And, and so the act of resistance is important because you may not win. Um, I mean, the way that that um, the display was, it was as though uh, the Oba had lost this. And I, I thought the smile on his face was to say, well, you, we will revisit this and we will come back to this moment and talk about what happened and the morality of what happened, the ethics of what happened, the, the issues of exploitation, the issues of environment, all the things that we're talking about again today. So I, I wanted to make just another case for uh, the importance of standing up and saying no, um, because it doesn't always <laughs> mean that the next day you win, but uh, in the long run, you, you, you do create a space for discussion and conversation of what happened. Uh, I think that's a really important point and I'm glad you uh, brought it up like this. Now, I think um, we're getting to the point where we're going to start drawing towards a close, but it seems to me that this is a good point to try and bring people in on to talk about, about resistance. I think how we can talk about perhaps bringing together resistance that people have talked about in museums in Britain, um, in adjusting what's shown in museums um, and even in other areas like for instance because of the Black Lives Matter movement the National Trust has been forced to put up on things about its stately homes that some of them were paid for out of the slave trade that's a change that's come this year because of people resisting um, so those kinds of connections in Britain but also very much with the, what the last contribution was saying about people resisting both in the past and in the present elsewhere. So I suppose I, I would like to 
ask each of the speakers to come in and make um unless another question comes up probably closing remarks on um resistance what they think should happen now in order to um um in order to sorry i'm getting us in order to keep the change coming continue the conversation um i don't know if um we want to come up i shall probably call in the others first and finish up with dan if that's all right with you um i can't remember who spoke hasn't spoken for longest so i shall bring dear in if that's okay um yes thanks so much ken um I suppose my answer towards resistance um, actually also talks to Chris's really great point about the normalization of, of violence um, and empire that you see in spaces like museums. Um, and to me, part of <coughs> resistance is, you know, defamiliarizing these spaces to ourselves and defamiliarizing defamiliar what history really is. And, and for me, I think we've come to the point now at last where talking about as an empire, as a benevolent force just has to go. And we have to just reject that. And as historians really look for evidence, evidence in the archives, evidence in the memories of people from whom objects were taken or, or looted to, to recover a history that was fundamentally violent and extractivist. And for me, as a historian, that's where resistance lies in uncovering this evidence. Thank you. Um, Chris, do you want to come in again? Yeah, just, um, I think very sort of briefly to say, I think the the power of resistance is a lot of our movements, particularly in the UK, have, are often very dominated by particular groups. And um, what are often the, the movements that really catalyze change and that win is where they are intersectional, where you see coalitions and alliances between different struggles. And back in February, there was this, this mass protest at the British Museum. And one of the main focuses was BP sponsorship. But actually within that, there were campaigners on restitution, on anti-racism, on all aspects of the museum and how we could reimagine what that museum could be. And it was a very different kind of, of creative protest that happened in the museum on that day. And I think it really signaled a, a kind of change. So that was a really exciting moment, a possibility. And next year, we're actually coming up to a moment when the British Museum is going to decide whether to renew its partnership with BP. So it's a really significant moment to ramp that up again. But, but like I say, I think the mistake would be if it was just a small group of climate activists. It's actually bringing all of these dis different groups together and saying, how can we work together to actually kind of build a movement that's going to deliver the changes we want? Thank you. Um, Anya Kachi, do you have any brief uh, yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with Chris about the need for um, alliances and, and these intersectional movements. And, and to, to remember that one of the biggest mass movements ever in this country was the movement to ab abolish slavery um, in, in the, <coughs> in the um, uh, 18th century. So we, we need to recover that. And, and yes, the establishment move um, the decks on, on the Titanic around uh, and, and uh, got to reward themselves when the institution was finally abolished in, uh, in the 1830s. But um, the push from the ground was really, really important. And, and then going forward 100 years in 1907, um, we, were, we had 100 years of the abolition of the trade and there were no events. I've gone through... Uh, the newspapers of the period marking that occasion. And then 200 years later in 2007, there's a, a year long uh, focus on the abolition. Why, what, what happens in that hundred years? And what happens is that the empire comes home and voices as uh, they're saying, begin to tell the other side of the story and to insist that there is another side of the story. So the curriculum is um, activism around the curriculum is really important so that this Atlantic space that was co-created by the enslaved, by Africans, some enslaved, others not, and their resources by Europeans and also by Native Americans can be described 
in its richness rather than it, it being simply a creation of European dominance and supremacy. Thank you. Um, just before I call um, Dan in to give his concluding remarks, uh, I would like to remind people why we're here, which is to um, talk about the launch of this book um, by Dan Hicks, The Brutish Museums, The Benin Bronzes, Colonial Violence and Cultural Restitution, uh, which you can get um, from Bookmarks Bookshop, among other places, um, but you can get it off on the Bookmarks uh, website. Uh, this meeting, the interesting discussion on various aspects of resistance, um, if you didn't manage to catch all of it, um, it has been being recorded. You will be able to watch the recording online on various platforms. It will be uh, essentially on YouTube. I believe you'll be able to watch it on Twitter or Facebook as well. Um, so it's not the end. So I hope people will follow up on the things that have come here um, and will um, want to watch it or watch it again. Um, but I will ask Dan to come in uh, to sum up the discussion and, um, well, to make his concluding remarks. Thanks, Dan. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I have to say, you know, you know, great um, to... Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. I don't know if this is just me, but I can't really hear you. Yeah. Your voice is suddenly gone. Um, can you try speaking again? Uh, you're a bit wobbly. I don't know what's changed. You were very clear before. Yeah, it might be my... Um, How is it, that? Ah, <laughs> yes. Uh, yep. Yeah. Okay, okay thanks, Ken. Um, so, okay, and so as I was saying, um, uh, a really wonderful panel, you know, loads I could say about what everyone has said. You know, I just want to go to Onikachi's uh, 10 Rs, you know, which I really like. And, you know, maybe add some more R's to your 10. So Please. we have, you know, recognition and uh, restoration, you know, reparations. You know, I want to add, obviously, you know, reading is important. That's a part of what we can do next. Um, and, you know, I think actually writing is, is, is obviously important as well. But I also want to say the third of my R's would be arithmetic. So one thing it does is it um, actually lists, you know, where these objects are. It's incredible how we don't know, you know, where African objects are in the UK. You know, the uh, the Sarsavwa report underlined that 95% of, of Africa's heritage is, is outside of the continent. But I, I would add that here in the UK, less than 1% of those objects you know, are, are, are actually on display. And of the 99% that we don't know about, you know, actually a lot of these are in boxes that haven't been opened for 100 years. We, you know, they're not on databases, you know. So in the restitution conversation, you know, we have to sort of think about that. You know, importantly, the message of the book is we have to, while all of these, these other activities are so crucial, you know, in the museum, you know, diversifying ourselves, you know, positive action, you know, absolutely, you know, thinking about the sites of the museums as sort of sites of conscience. You know, you know, actually it's a book about returning objects when they're demanded as well. So let's not lose sight of this. This is about, you know, actually returning objects, uh, you know, when they're asked for. So how can we do that? Well, you know, you know, one thing the book argues is we need actually to you know, provincialize and to decenter our national institutions. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people would say or would imagine, you know, that all of the Benin objects are in the British Museum, but in reality, only eight percent or so of, of uh, you know, what was taken, you know, is there. And 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 across, as the book says, you know, across over 150 institutions around the world.
you know, that is where these objects are. And each of those institutions is able to make their own returns. So here in the UK, you know, you're never more than 150 miles away from, from a looted African object. And essentially, I mean, what I want to do is to see, you know, conversations happening in different ways, in different, you know, locations across the country when African objects are in Leeds, are in Oxford, are in uh, Belfast, are in Edinburgh, are, are in Exeter, you know, Cambridge, Birmingham, Bristol, you know, let's have a conversation happening at grassroots level in each of those locations. Fundamentally as well, we need to remember the relationship of, you know, these objects and their taking with ongoing structures of institutional racism, you know, and importantly, you know, the relationship really, you know, with, you know, with anti-black violence. So this is exactly as, you know, with, with the conversation over environmental, you know, justice, this is about uh, justice in the present. This, you know, is about understanding the relationships in between the incarceration of objects and, you know, the narratives that we tell, you know, about race in the present. So, yeah, yeah, fundamentally, uh, you know, the book says that time's up and that we need to work, all of us, you know, actually, you know, to work for the restitution, you know, of the Benin object, but also to widen that conversation out so we can look across the continent of Africa. You know, as a, as a you know, museum worker, my job on the one side is to excavate and to share the knowledge of uh, what is in these, you know, institutions, and at the same time to amplify, you know, to listen to and to act upon your know, demands as and when they are made from Africa. So hopefully that's something that everyone listening to this is able to, you know, join in with. Um, okay. Um, thank you. I'd just, um, well, like to, I've got, got, got a request from Dia first to say uh, thanks to, um, who was it to Aelk uh, for your comments. Um, but after that, I would like to say thank you to all our panelists. I think it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, I hope that people will order the book. I hope that people will look um, at the um, at the bookmarks website and see many of the other books that we've discussed are also available. Um, and we'll return to other discussions like this, which Bookmarks holds, and we'll follow up the various campaigns that have been talked here about here tonight, because uh, this is a meeting about activism. Um, and we'll tell your friends that you can watch this um, discussion online on the various um, areas that I've places that I've talked about. So thanks for coming to the meeting. Thanks again to all the panelists. That's Dan Hicks, Dia Gupta, Anya Kachi Wampu and Chris Garrard. Um, and thanks to everyone who came and good night to all of you. So have a good time. Thanks to Ken. Thank you. Oh, right. <laughs>